Welcome to the 24th annual Miami Jewish Film Festival, one of the world's largest and oldest Jewish cultural art events. We want to thank all of our members, sponsors, community partners, volunteers, and especially all of you film lovers and presenting sponsors, the Center for the Advantage, Advancement of Jewish Education, SAGE, and the Greater Miami Jewish Federation for their continued support throughout all of these years. My name is Jeannie Milgram, and I am a direct descendant of the Crypto Jews of Portugal. So I am especially excited to be moderating a virtual conversation with producer Derek Jeffries and Dr. Michael Rothwell. And just a little background, um, Dr. Michael Rothwell is an active member of the community of Porto, and he has dual Portuguese-British nationalities. He has been on the board in the community since 1995 and has lived in Portugal for several decades. Lucky you. <laughs> Always in the city of Oporto. And uh, Dara Jeffries is an attorney at White & Case. Dara and her family are currently based in Miami with very strong ties to Portugal, where she grew up. She is the chairman of the supervisory board of the Jewish community of Porto, of which she has been a member since she was a child. So this is very, very personal to you. So thank you all for joining us. Dara, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Jeannie. So I'd like to um, uh, say, and Dr. Rothwell wasn't here with us last time, but I, it was an honor for me to interview you when you were here a couple of years ago with uh, the movie Sephiroth. This particular movie I thought was excellent. My own family in 1618 was being hunted by the Inquisition in Coimbra, just down the street. So for me, to, to watch this, it stirred in me incredible amounts of emotions because I had followed, uh, I had followed their footsteps and, and I even wrote a book about when they were there. So I researched it historically and um, it, it, it's just really stirred a lot of emotions. So I'd like to know if you could tell us a little bit about yourselves and uh, and where you're from originally and how you got involved in doing this. Well, um, as you mentioned, I, I grew up in Portugal and so I've always been involved in the community. Um, and the, the community of uh, Porto has uh, a mission really of promoting Jewish culture and education and outreach to the wider community. Uh, we provide training for teachers. We have thousands of students that visit and we really try and you know, take away some of the mystery about Judaism. And so the movie uh, is part of that mission. It's part of four films, actually. You mentioned Sepharad. Uh, we also did a, another small short film that was very much appreciated called The Nuns Kaddish. Um, and we also did another one called Light of Judah. And the proceeds of that movie were actually sent to food banks in Israel and Portugal. And it was part of a cultural outreach that we did together with um, and, and charitable mission that we did with the Catholic Church. Uh, the Diocese of Porto. So in fact, interestingly enough, the Diocese of Porto, the Catholic Church has actually worked very closely uh, with us um, in, in the film and in, and in promoting it and so on. So, so I guess the idea behind it was, uh, as I said, part of the education mission of telling the story. Sepharad was really just a little snapshot and very focused on our own community. And it felt like there was a big gap in the story there. And so we felt that this was a really important part of the story that needed to be told and hadn't really been told before. So it, it, it made for a really good, good focus of a film. So, so that's why we did that. Wonderful. And Dr. Rafa, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your involvement in this? Well, Gina, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting us to uh, this um, session. It's a great pleasure to um, <clears throat> tell the festival a, a bit about our film and, and consequently about our community and about Portugal and Sepharad. Um, as you mentioned, I, I'm British by origin. I was born in Manchester <clears throat> and uh, then uh, much later on came to live in, in Portugal. And I've lived, uh, as you said, in a port of several decades. During that time, I've been a member of the Jewish community of Porto, which has witnessed a, a spectacular um, uh, resurgence 
And a lot of that's got to do with um, reconnecting to the Sephardic world um, th uh, through the law, of the law of return, as you know, the Portuguese law of return has brought us in contact with the Sephardic world. As, and independently of this, we, we've made a point of researching our, our uh, community's history. And um, there are a number of stories that had not been told. Um, the whole story of the Sephardi in the of our community in the 20th century uh, was, was well researched and of course documented in the film Sephirat. And one particular episode of that film was the, the reception of the, uh, the Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany and, and Nazi occupation. And that has led to actually the opening of a, a new museum that uh, Dyer alluded to. The, besides our Jewish museum, we now have a local, new Holocaust museum in Oporto, which is uh, um, Again, as you can imagine, a lot of attention in Portugal. And as Dara said, this is all part of, um, on the one hand, we're in a unique position to tell certain stories which are not known, the stories told in Safarad. Also, the stories regarding the, the, this particular uh, role that Oporto, the Oporto community played in the, in the rescuing and the looking after uh, refugees, which is told in the film Safarad, but in a lot more detail and documented in the new museum. And <clears throat> as I said, this is also part of our educational mission, and which is it obviously always has the question of anti-Semitism as a backdrop. You know, we, the best way to, to guard against anti-Semitism is that to educate the Portuguese people specifically uh, about the, um, the, the Jewish background, the Jewish history of Portugal, which is so important. And uh, currently it's so regrettable this, is simply not mentioned in in the, uh, the the Jewish I'm sorry the Portuguese uh, standard historical history textbooks, and this is something we want to see we want to see fixed. We're pressing for this. Meanwhile, uh, we do our own part by uh, having produced these museums and welcoming thousands of school children, uh, Portuguese school children, every year, and therefore um, the, the moment so they'll be able once this. Uh, pandemic allows, they'll be able not only to learn about Jewish history and Sephardi history, but specifically about the, the Holocaust episode and uh, the, the role that uh, the Oporto Synagogue uh, played in that. That's really, um, I, I want to ask you, so Dara told me that now you have about 500 members, and before we get into the movie, just to understand a little bit about the, the modern Oporto versus the uh, you know, the movie uh, so centuries ago. So are these mostly Ashkenaz or are these people claiming to have the, or descendants like I am, or, or what is the mix of the community? Uh, do you want me to take this, Dara? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> yes, that, that, that's a very good question. Uh, our uh, community is a very mixed community. We have Ashkenazim, we have Sephardim, Sephardim, we have um, very religious Jews, very orthodox Jews, we have uh, much less religious Jews and some that are not religious at all. And they all have a, a great role to play in, in, in our community. And uh, that's one of the things that's uh, uh, extraordinary about our community is the way that <clears throat> Jews of all types, origins and degrees of faith get on together. And, uh, uh, and these films and, and museums show have produced uh, um, extraordinary results. And well, I, would just, um, I would just add that that to me is perhaps the most unique, I think it's a very unique situation of our community. I, I can't even think of any other in the world that is quite like ours because, you know, usually you have, you know, there's, I go to that one, but I don't go to that one, you know, it's that kind of thing. And we don't have that. I mean, we really have a community that's melded with all, as Mike said, you know, all, all types of, of observance, you know, from very observant to not observant at all, um, but, but brought together by this sense of community. And I think that is one of the things that I'm particularly proud of and makes me very happy that we're able to do that because I think it's quite a unique situation. No, and you're definitely firmly planted in history. First of all, your building is beautiful. I mean, it is just, you know, the minute that you open the doors, it, it's just amazing. And, you know, you just feel... Um, when I when I've been there several times, you just 
feel that it envelops you. So, so I, I think that you're going to be making films for many more years uh, to come. So can you, um, either of you, give us an overview of how you came to produce the film, this particular film, and the motivation? I'm, I'm sorry, Jean, I, I didn't actually answer your previous question, which is about <laughs> I'm sorry. The, the, the mix of, um, uh, the current mix of our community. Uh, I've explained it's mixed with everybody, but it, 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 before this resurgence started, it, the community was a mixture of Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews, but probably um, a slight majority of Ashkenazi Jews. And with this growth, the 500 members that, that you mentioned, um, the situation is now quite different. The, the vast majority, but by no means all, but the vast majority of our new members are Sephardic. And so our, our community is now, um, let's say, as it should be, as we would wish it to be, uh, a, a majority Sephardic community. And what's very interesting is that we have, they have two minions, we have two rabbis, we have an Ashkazi rabbi, we have a Sephardi rabbi. And uh, it's got to the point where in, in the uh, high uh, festivals, the uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, so we have um, uh, separate minions. We, have a, we had to create a small prayer room downstairs for the Ashkenazi minion and the main prayer room for the Sephardi minion. So that's uh, where we stand right now. So that's to answer your, your question. And we, of course, think it's wonderful to have that Sephardic heritage back uh, in uh, live in a very living way in our community. Great, so I guess my, now that you clarified that, my, my next question would be with the Sephardi minion, are they doing uh, Spanish Portuguese rites like Bevis Marks? In other words, the rituals, are they Spanish Portuguese or are they Sephardic? <clears throat> so uh, that's a very good question. Uh, they're, they're mostly Sephardic, um, Using Sephardic right uh, rather than uh, the the best okay. Bismarck type one, they're, they're a small a sm smaller minority. So most most of our Sephardic members have um, not. Let me say this: either they descended from people who uh, left um, Portugal right at the time of the expulsion, yeah. or if uh, and some others are left later on, uh, but then joined um, uh, traditional Sephardic uh, congregations. That's interesting. Uh, when people ask me what I consider myself, because I was born Catholic, I returned uh, 35 years ago, and I've been practicing since, I consider myself a Spanish Portuguese Jew. I don't really consider myself, and more so I consider myself a Portuguese Jew, uh, because um, like the people in your film, I descend from exactly people that were doing that, selling and so on. And, and we were kind of frozen in time. So we didn't have that whole Sephardic history. We became frozen as Portuguese Jews. And then we kind of woke up, you know, 600 years later. So um, that's always been fascinating to me um, that I've never been able to identify uh, personally with Sephardic Jews. And a lot of people don't, it's a very subtle difference but um, there definitely is a difference with that. Um, so tell me the overview and how you came to produce this. So I think as I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, we had started with Sefarad that was a very sort of inward looking uh, focus on, on our community per se and it's very specific story of, of Captain Baroj Basso and how the community grew and so on. And it was obvious that, that there was a important to tell the background and, and what had happened in Portugal because the Inquisition is so unique to Portugal and Spain and that that was uh, and and usually people associate the Inquisition with Spain they don't really realize that there was an Inquisition in Portugal too and uh, you know I would say that if you ask anybody about the Inquisition they would never think oh Portugal no they think the Spanish Inquisition but it was in, in Portugal also and, um, and in fact, it only ended in the 19th century. If you can imagine, the Inquisition was only officially ended in the 19th century. So that's really an incredibly big part of history when this went on. Um, and Porto was a very unique place in many ways. And of course, you know that and you've been there. And uh, we're very proud of, of how Jews have always had really good relations with their neighbors 
uh, particularly in Porto, I mean, Jews in Portugal in general, but Porto in particular. And, and that's kind of what the movie wants to, to do, because again, as we were mentioning earlier, it, it's part of our mission to try and, and foster a good image of Judaism, foster a good image and good relations with, uh, with our Catholic and, 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 his, and Muslim friends as well. And, and I think this movie tries to do that, to show that yes, there was the Inquisition, but it really wasn't you know, supported by everybody. And certainly there were many, many Catholics in Porto that were against it and were not happy at all that the Inquisition had come to, to their city and defended the Jews and protected them. And so we feel that's a really good story to tell. It's not, doesn't just have this horrible part. It's got this really right, right, nice right. part that there were people there that were willing to, to protect the Jews. Um, and and that was really just, the motivation. Can I just take up what Dara said that the, that's really important that uh, although you know, Portugal is part of Sepharad, um, Portugal is special and we think that Oporto is even more special because of the particular uh, attitude that the, 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 the citizens, the, the city authorities, and even the church took. Um, just to give you some idea, the, um, the Inqui Inquisition office in Oporto only lasted six years from 1541 to 1547, and then it was booted out. And after that, uh, all the inquisitional visits took place from the city you mentioned, Coimbra. Correct, and not just Coimbra, then it went over to Evora and, um, and other, I, I, I must tell you that for me, Porto has, it's a city that has a lot of light. It's a city that from the minute you drive in, you feel the light. And I don't know if it's light from the people, I don't know if it's light, but the minute that you start driving into Coimbra, and maybe it's because I know, and when you know, you know, but the minute you drive into Coimbra, I feel like it's a dark shroud. And I like my throat tightens until I leave Coimbra. It's like I want to go in and go out. And Porto is just such a light. Um, it, it's just different. So I can see why it would only last six years, because I don't think that they would be able to, to take it. Um, was this based, uh, this movie, 1618, was it based on a particular family true story? Uh, would you like to say that? Sure, Mike, go ahead. Well, um, <clears throat> before, uh, rather, Dara mentioned before that the previous film that we, we mentioned, that we made, was focused mostly on our, our own community, the 20th century history, but you'll, everybody will remember that it actually starts with the expulsion of the Jews, a very, very, very powerful scenes of uh, you know, almost violence against the Jews after the signing of the expulsion edict. But then the, the and, and, and the, the movie does show um, peaceful scenes in Oporto before that happened. And I'd just like to mention something I didn't say earlier on, which is why Oporto is like that. And uh, the, 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 the reason is basically because um, it's a city of workers, of, of merchants, of very pragmatic people. And the, the city of Oporto therefore was never interested in the religious fanatical ideas of the capital. And that's what, and that's been a, a characteristic of Oporto all through history. And, and that's why Oporto kicked out the Inquisition and the Oporto citizens, many of whom were also merchants, would protect the, 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 the fellow Jews. So getting back to, to the question, so we made this film which starts with these peaceful scenes of coexistence with Jews in uh, the, the end of the, the 15th century, at the time uh, of the sudden signing of the edict and the expulsion. And then the, full, the film, as you know, fasts forward to the 20th century, to the, to the beginnings of the modern uh, Jewish community. And obviously there's a big gap there, which we felt really needed filling. And that is the, the origin of, of, of this film. Um, and uh, of course, we've, we've uh, mentioned, we've told it through an episode that happened in our, our city of Oporto, which was a, a particular inquisitorial visit, which produced uh, terrible consequences in 1618, hence the name of the film. But the, the family that it was following, that the film was following, was that based on a true or that was a collective, um, a, a collective experience for many of the families? Or did you follow that one family? So some of the characters that are in the film are, are 
from real life, right? So the visitor himself is a real person, the bishop, Dr. Rodrigo Acuna, the president of the court, you know, many of these characters are real people, but the others are really an amalgam of, of the sort of characters that we've learned about that existed at the time and certain families that were there. So there were new Christians in Porto at the time, you know, the Alvarez and the Mocato families, these were actually families that, that were there and were very involved in philanthropy and, uh, and to this day, uh, in fact. Um, but they were not, they were more symbolic than, than real characters. I mean, there are some stories, we'll, we'll get to maybe a little bit later about that, that, that have been told, um, but it's not exactly, you know, real people. Right, well, interesting because I think that your characters embodied the just about every experience that that the Jews were living at the time and was there more than one inquisitorial visit or was that 1618 the only one that happened there well there were many uh, inquisitorial visits over the time what happened was during the the the, the 15th century I'm sorry the 16th century we're talking about the 1500s uh, was that um Generally, um, the, 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 the powerful Jews and the main Jews in Oporto were, were able to bribe the, the, the Christians so they knew when an inquisitorial visit was going to happen and they would make themselves scarce. And this was a regular occurrence. And that's why they didn't leave the country because they managed to, I mean, many le left the country during the 15th century, during the whole Inquisition, but that's why some still stayed was because they were able to somehow live with it. Uh, what, what happened uh, was different, and it's no coincidence that we're talking about a period of Portuguese history from 1580 to 1640, when Portugal was under, the, under Spanish rule. And so um, the, 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 the Spanish king of Portugal, uh, who, who appears in the film, was at a certain point determined to be much more rigorous about these visits and the, the, the particular point about the, these visits in about 1618 was that nobody was spared, that even the most powerful uh, wealthy Jews had been able to protect themselves up to that point, were no longer protected. And this is what led to a mass exodus of the new Christians, because they, sure, they saw that they, 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 they had to think of the future of their families, their families were not safe. Uh, anymore, and this is what, as I said, led to the the, the, the movement to, for example, for example, to Holland and later to London, uh, to the North Portuguese, uh, North European communities. That's why uh, this particular visit was uh, marked a change in a tone and led to a mass exodus of the new Christians. So, when the Portuguese showed up in Amsterdam for the first time, or that it's recorded, maybe they you know, had shown up before, it was 1596. So this took place a uh, good 22 years later. Now, when they started leaving before that, was it also like having to hide and leave? Or was there ever a period where they could just sail away like in 1596 or right 1600? Or was it always a difficult uh, having to escape sort of thing? Uh, well, that's a very interesting question. Um, at the time of the actual edict, edict of expulsion, uh, so it was signed in 1496 and came into effect in 1497, um, uh, King Manuel, who, who was the man who signed the, the king who signed the ex expulsion order, uh, made it very difficult for the Jews to, to leave because he uh, didn't uh, actually mean uh, to expel the Jews. What he did was actually uh, he wanted to have his cake and eat it. Basically, he wanted to be able to marry the daughter of the powerful Spanish uh, monarchs and make that alliance. Uh, but uh, the condition, uh, as many of you will know, was they could only marry if he signed the expulsion order. So it was not something that came from his heart. He knew how important uh, the Jewish um, members of, of society were to Portugal. And he, he his idea was that they would... Uh, peacefully convert to Christianity but stay. Uh, that was his attitude. Um, but of course he was a king for only so many years and later on uh, you had other kings and particularly Spanish ones and, and uh, sons of Spanish queens who came to Portugal and th those uh, kings and queens took it more seriously. But um, 
once the, the, those Jews became the ones that remained, became new Christians, um, I, I, I'm not absolutely sure about this historical detail, but I, I, as, as far as I can know, they could leave the country, but there, certainly there was a flow of new Christians uh, leaving the country during the whole of the period of the Inquisition. It was only right at the beginning that the king did everything he could to stop anybody leaving at all. Let me, let me just add two things to this. First of all, as Mike mentioned, this was to do with the marriage, right? It was to do with the, that it was kind of a condition for marrying into Spanish royalty. And so to this day, to this day, and this is a little detail I always appreciate, there's a saying in Portuguese that says that from Spain, neither good winds nor good marriages, because Spain brings the hot desert winds sometimes, and so nobody likes those hot winds. And they always say, so the Spanier nem bon vento nem bon casamento. And it refers back to this marriage. So to this oh, day, people refer And it's, to still, it. it's still used. How, how interesting. It's an expression that still exists. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. And the second thing I wanted to say was that you know, to be honest, and it shows it in the film, these, there had to be, uh, it was a bit, it's a bit rather like the sort of the slave uh, underground railroad in, in America, right? Sure. You know, you had to have things set up and you had, for example, the story of Gracia Nazi, who was a, 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 a very wealthy banker, philanthropist and, and a woman that was very unusual at the time. But she set up, you know, points where people could be looked after and get money. And so all of this had to be financed. It wasn't such an easy thing. And, and I don't think people really realize it wasn't just like, well, why didn't you just leave? You could just have left, you know, like, no, it wasn't so easy to just leave. Not only were you being blocked because the king didn't want it. And there's a time when he literally wouldn't let the ships leave, but it was financially quite a, it's even like today, right? When people try and, and you see all these people that try and leave from one country to another, you know, how much money they have to pay to sort of sometimes traffickers even, you know? So even in that time, it wasn't so easy. And so it took a lot of money and not just everybody could leave. And so either they had their own means or they had these philanthropists that helped and set up, you know, routes and, and stopping points and so on. And, and, and somewhere they could go, they had to be fine. You know, they had to have someone to receive them at the other side. Interesting. So how was the research done for this particular film? Well, um, <clears throat> uh, that was based on the immense amount of historical documents that, that we have available. And um, uh, that, that was uh, done uh, by a department we have a, a, of historical research, which is, had already been working on uh, the historical research for Sepharad. And uh, they continued the, this, this research using historical documents for uh, 1618. And, and I must say that the, the historical documents of the Inquisition and other subsequent documents, Relaciones de Causa, and other things that are in the archives are very rich in detail. I've been able to, to pull um, recipes, for example, from a lot of these, which one wouldn't think that would affect the cooking, but these, um, they're very, very rich in detail. And a lot of people don't know that if you can uh, read a lot of these inquis inquis inquisition processos, they really are uh, an incredible uh, source of information. What about the costuming? Because I found the costuming to be in really, really very special in your film, very special. Yeah, well, our production company, uh, Lightbox, did uh, obviously an enormous amount of research on this and uh, spared no expense to make everything uh, just right. And um, we're not only talking about the clothes people were wearing. We're talking about uh, key objects like the the ship that they set sail in, uh, which we were lucky to be able to have access to a real caravel ship, and the other things we ha we had to ma have uh, made to order. Uh, and the particular case there is the um, the jail cart, which we had to make it, and and now it's uh, uh, standing outside our Jewish museum for people people to see. The that jail cart thing, was very, oh. I love that jail cart, it was. The only other thing I would say is that people don't realize, especially if you're living in the States, which is a, such a new country, of course, Portugal is a very old country and a lot of the historical buildings and they're still there. They, we use them all the time. So it wasn't as difficult as you might imagine to recreate certain scenes and villages because the villages are exactly as they were. And some of those buildings are exactly, the courthouse and the jailhouse and yes. you know all these things were exactly as they were at that time. 
So from that perspective, you know, we were very fortunate because you have the scenes and the settings all around you. So, you know, that part was just there. It's just- No, for that. sure. I, I had an experience that now that you're saying about how old they were. So I had this drawing in the family of uh, one of the brides. And I, I think it must have gone back to like the late 1600s, 1700s. And she was from Portugal. And so the drawing showed her in a black wedding dress. And that also always kind of like horrified me because I thought maybe she was in mourning, I couldn't. So it was a very elaborate wedding dress. And then one day I'm on the, I'm in Portugal, I'm in a tiny museum, I don't know where, somewhere near the, near the, the Dauda River. And I walk in and the first thing I see is on a, on a mannequin, this black wedding dress that my grandmother, I had a, my, this, uh, I think it was my eighth or 10th grandmother. And so it was one of the originals. It could have been hers. So yes, these things are still in these little villages. A lot of these artifacts have somehow made it through. And, uh, it, uh, and like you say, a lot of people don't realize that when we walk the streets in Portugal, in a lot of these villages, uh, they are exactly the same as, as they were the same stones and, and everything. So, but uh, the costuming did impress me a lot. So um, I, I, there was a saying in the film, I do not love stone and wood, Adonai is my ship. Is that something that the crypto Jews said in church or how did that come up? So, so that was something that came up in, in research and that, that, was, that was found that it was, it, there was variations or versions of that saying that different, you know, the, 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 the crypto Jews would say in different villages. So this was sort of a, a version of that. And I think this one was the closest was in Belmonte. So, so this one was what Belmonte would say. And they would say, I don't love stone or wood, but all that God governs. Um, they would say that in Portuguese, obviously. And they did not say that in church. This was when they were having their, their, their own sort of prayers at home, at home, their secret prayers. That was part of their ritual um, that they would say. This was not something they would say in public. This was their own sort of private prayers. Very interesting. Were you able to get um, information on the time from the community of Belmonte um, who kept this for so many centuries? Or, or um, did you use, were you able to use them at all? I, I don't think we did this particular time round, but we do have relationships with them and, you know, we visited and, and we know them well and we know the community well. And so this was not so much from talking to them as much as from historical archives that we that we had access to. Yeah, I, I, if I can take over there, right here, there. as you know, the, the community of Belmont has been uh, the object of a great deal uh, of interest, lots of, lots of research being done into a lot of uh, uh, papers have, and books have been published about it. So once again, we were able to uh, use uh, the, the, the many resources that uh, are now available, thank, thanks to the, the work that's been done during the 20th century. I find particularly interesting um, when I've read the manuscripts that of the, of the correspondence, and I have most of them here at home, that was going back and forth between London and, uh, and Portugal in the 19, I think it was 1925, when they set up um, a, an institution in London to let's say deal with this problem. So a lot of that correspondence is, is very rich and, and many people may not know that that exists, but that's available. You can get it on the internet. There's books written about it, the actual um, transcription of the correspondence going between the actual established community in London and uh, trying to figure out what was going on in, in Portugal. And I think that's the only country where we see this. Yeah, and that was part of a big focus in Sepharad, right? That whole dynamic going back and forth and how, and, 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 and the conflict in fact, that existed over how to deal with the situation. So we didn't so, focus on that in this film, but Sepharad does address that quite a lot. Right, so the research for the four films, because um, maybe you, you told me that there were two other films that were done, um, it, it, because we've seen Sephirot and, and we saw the 1618. Now, what are the names of the other two films? So th there's one very short film called The Nun's Kaddish, and to, to be honest, it's my favorite. It's very short and I recommend it, and it's, I think it's fairly easy to get. 
And actually, Nuns Kaddish was originally part of Sepharad, but Sepharad turned out to be incredibly long and, and it seemed out of place with the rest of the story, just distracted. And it was such a beautiful little story itself that we felt it was better to just make it into its own little, little vignette. Um, and so Nuns Kaddish, which is this, a true story of a member of our community that died and the nuns that had been taking care of him said Kaddish for him. And so again, a very ecumenical cross religion, you know, just kind, kind movie, which, which I really appreciate. And actually the Pope really liked it. He saw it and he wrote us a letter. He liked it very much. So that's one of them. And then the fourth one is again, sort of an amalgam. It was called Light of Judah. And it was, it was made specifically um, pulling different pieces from the films we'd made. So it wasn't really, it's a separate film per se, but it was made to be um, uh, for charitable purposes. So it was, it was, it was used to raise money for um, food banks in Portugal and in Israel, together with the with the Catholic diocese. So that was a separate little project. Um, so was the research that was done to make 1618, was your research kind of spilling over one into the other? Yeah, very much so. As I mentioned before, uh, our uh, cultural uh, research department had been working, uh, had been working on the research for Sepharad. Um, continue to do research for this film. The only difference was that this, the uh, 1618 is, is although we've uh, placed it in a Porto, uh, invo involves the much uh, wider community and it's not just focused on our own historical records so much. Good, so I was particularly fascinated by your character, Daniel. Um, I, I thought that, that he just carried himself in such a way um, can you tell us a little bit more about the development of that character? Was he a real character in history? Or um, because he, he was fascinating. And at the end, he, it was actually Daniel that, that pulled the whole thing together when he got on that ship. It, it, it kind of made the whole uh, crypto-Jewish experience come full circle for me when he got on that ship. Well, obviously, they character of Daniel is, is key and he's not based on one particular real character but he is a, a composite of a whole number of uh, different Eucharistian characters and of somebody uh, where you see this conflict between uh, on the one hand uh, wanting to abide by the law but on the other hand his, his Jewish heart uh, speaks louder. So I actually, I also found him very handsome. So, what do you? <laughs> and uh, sitting on top of the horse, it was even better. <laughs> I, I can tell you that the love story itself, although it's not, it's this particular love story isn't a true story. It is based on uh, something that uh, we read about. And in fact, the historian Cecil Roth wrote about in his history of the Maranos. He tells of a story of a Portuguese man and a woman who fell in love on the high seas. Um, and when they first went to Amsterdam and, and, were, and, and were amongst the first people to found the community in Amsterdam, this couple that kind of met on a ship and then became part of the community. So it was kind of trying to, you know, draw, draw a little bit of attention to that story. It's not exactly those characters, but it is that sort of story. Right, I, I understand. And, and I loved how he kind of tied it all together. Um, so do you feel that the movie was made from the new Christian or crypto Jewish point of view or made more from a Catholic point of view or neutral? Yes, I would say neutral because obviously it's the viewpoint of, of ours, right? It's from the Jewish community looking back to the point in history. But I think what's important in this story and that's as I think I referenced earlier is to show that it's not one you know, monolithic, there's the Catholic viewpoint. No, there was very different viewpoints, right? Because you had the Inquisition and you had that viewpoint. And then you had the Catholics and Christians that lived in, in Porto and how how they were on the side of, of the new Christians, right? So so you can't really say they were they were they were opposing viewpoints. In many ways they, they were together. And that's kind of one of the things we're trying to show that yes, there was conflict and there were people that were attacking them. And you had that that you know the girl that was you had the gossips and you have the people that that are you know, betraying them and so on. And you certainly had those people, but you also have a lot of people that were protecting them. So, you know, I would say it's neutral, but at the same time, trying to show 
that the relations were good and that, that at the time it really, it, it, it was, it, there was a positive um, interaction at the time. And, and, and not only that, I, I noticed in Portugal that historically the, the two religions melded very much. I mean, one of my favorites is the, the Saint Esther of Purim that, um, you know, to be able to, to do the fast of Purim because a lot of times the, the Yom Kippur fast wasn't done. So it took the place with the fast of Esther and then she became Saint Esther and that mixing of the Catholic and, and the Jewish actually became a whole, uh, a whole, I won't, don't want to say religion, but a whole uh, I, uh, way of, of, you know, viewing religion. And I know that I have, um, I know many people that are Portuguese that still have this duality and, and many don't realize they're Catholic today. They don't realize that a lot of it comes from that. So Actually, you just reminded me of something. And when you were mentioning earlier about the recipes, uh, you know, as you know very well, there's a famous dish that is literally a national dish, and I am sure many people that eat it don't realize its origins, which is, of course, alheiras. And alheiras is a kind of turkey or, 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 ch or chicken sausage, and it was always garlic, very garlic. Pork sausages, so that the Jews could hang these in their kitchen and, and pretend, you know, and, and, you know, not give away the fact that they were Jews. The new Christians would hang these, these alheiras, but to this day, Alleda's is a popular dish and it's eaten. It's not, it's not like it's something from history. No, that again, something that is literally, you can go to a restaurant and order Alleda's and, and I don't think people really know the history of it, but it's part of tradition. It's part of culture to this day as well. No, for sure. There's one more, I mean, that I'm aware of. I'm sure there's many. So I was lucky enough to have found Inquisition recipes in my mom's house from Spain, not from Portugal. So there's this one dish that is called in Spain, it's called ornaso, And it's like a big empanada full of meats. And um, one time I was in, in Belmonte right after one of the fasts and I saw that they were making it. And they said, oh, this is what back in the day we used to eat as if we were in a picnic um, after we fasted. And it is still, I don't know what it's called in, in Portugal, but it was called Ornaso in Spain. So I think a lot of these uh, cultural foods made their way into, into yeah. even our lives today. Um, tell me, do we have a sneak peek into your next film that we'll be able to talk about in a year? Honestly, I, I'm sad to say, but I think this is gonna be it. I mean, we really feel we've told the story and what we wanted to tell. Um, you know, it, I think we've come full circle. Uh, we told, you know, the modern day story. We've told, you know, what how, the origins of the story. I mean, unless we go back to sort of the Phoenicians and the Romans, which I don't think we're going to do. Uh, so I think we've told the story we're going to tell, and now we're going to focus on some of our other missions, you know, which is obviously the, the museum, you know, that's taking up a lot of, of time and effort with the, with the Holocaust Museum um, and, and continuing to do educational. And of course the films are a big part of that, right? Because they're gonna be shown in the museums. And so continuing with our, with our charitable and educational um, outreach, but I don't think we'll be doing another film, at least not anytime soon. I think that you and your team should all go to Spain and do over there because that's sorely lacking. I, I think that y'all make a great team. I think you should definitely make your way over to Spain and even Mexico. Look, this could be like your lifetime. Um, you did such a great job and the community. Um, is there anything else you'd like to have people know? Anything you'd like to tell us? Uh, just to come and visit and see for yourselves. I think, I think, I think, Port I mean, Portugal has become a hot spot which I'm not actually that thrilled about, but it literally is now one of the most popular tourist destinations, just in general, irrespective of, of the Jew Jewish aspect. But Jewish history and Jewish culture is so infused throughout, which, which Dina, you know, and you've attested to, throughout Portugal, there's so many historic uh, relics and buildings and, 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 and just in cultural and language and, and so many things that I think anybody that is interested in these things would find it would find it very interesting for sure. Absolutely. And uh, Michael, is there anything from your end you'd like us to to take away with? We've covered quite a lot. Well, I absolutely agree, agree with uh, Dara's last remarks that um, uh, the takeaway is yes, please come and visit us because you know Portugal is a, 
a beautiful country full of uh, historic, uh, beautiful historic villages and towns and cities. And on top of that, uh, you get the, the Jewish experience. There's uh, a lot of, uh, uh, Portugal is now a destination which is popular amongst the uh, Jewish tourists. And with our films to see and our two museums um, in Oporto, there are very powerful reasons indeed to visit us and, and besides that to see our beautiful uh, synagogue. Absolutely. Well, um, I'd like to thank you, Dara Jeffries and Dr. Michael Rothwell of 1618 for joining us. Um, once again, we'd like to thank all of our members, sponsors, community partners, volunteers, all of you film lovers, and especially our, our presenting sponsor, the Center for the Advancement of Jewish Education, SAGE, and the Greater Miami Jewish Federation for their continued support for all of these years. And thank you especially to our audience for participating in the 24th annual Miami Jewish Film Festival. So until the next time, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.